En primer lugar, quiero agradecerles por estar y quiero agradecer al eh, profesor Pejara eh, por su visita a nuestra facultad. Eh, el tema del que va a estar hablando es un tema que está directamente vinculado con el tema que se está trabajando en este momento en el proyecto de sí. Eh, en equipo de trabajo que estamos investigando sobre empresas extractivas, básicamente empresas multinacionales en actividades extractivas eh, y el impacto negativo que suele tener cuando esto es excesivamente desregulado en lo que es respeto y efectivización de derechos humanos particularmente en lo que son comunidades indígenas. No es, exclu no es excluyente, pero son los grupos que se ven muchas veces eh, directamente afectados. Ahora, en este contexto, por supuesto, trabajamos muchos elementos, componentes, factores, elementos teóricos que tienen que ver con elementos económicos, políticos, normativos, de la práctica, sociales, culturales, y eso es lo que de alguna manera vinculó lo que nosotros estamos haciendo con lo que es el trabajo del profesor Greg Barra. Eh, él va a estar hablando de temas que nos afectan, siendo generados, podríamos decir, en otros contextos, eh, pero que tienen una directa vinculación. Nosotros trabajamos normalmente sobre lo que acontece, sucede en América Latina, pero directamente vinculado también justamente a lo que son políticas internacionales, economía internacional eh, y decisiones que se toman en otros contextos, pero en co-decisión, podríamos decir, en lo que es la aceptación a nivel local de lo que se decide en nuestro ámbito. Eh, bien, sin extender mucho más, simplemente para explicar esta relación, para que al escuchar la conferencia del profesor, todo el tiempo adviertan, de hecho está presente en su conferencia también, eh, adviertan la directa vinculación entre lo que él lo está planteando y el impacto que esto tiene en nuestro ámbito. Bien, el profesor Prepara, voy a hacer unas palabras para presentarlo, es eh, profesor de Criminología y eh, Justicia Penal en la PC Michigan University. Eh, fue profesor distinguido en el College de Justicia y Seguridad de la Eastern Kentucky University en 2017, o sea, en este año, como eh, miembro Fulbright, con reconocimiento de eh, la Fundación Fulbright, está teniendo una estadía de residencia en la Facultad de Derecho de la Pontificia Universidad Católica de Río Grande do Sur. En este momento está haciendo una estadía en Brasil eh, y Gracias a ese programa es que podemos contar estos días con su presencia acá en la Universidad de Buenos Aires. Eh, en el año 2003 eh, fue nombrado miembro, el miembro número 27, de un espacio muy eh, selecto en lo que hace el espacio académico, como lo es la Academia de eh, Ciencias Criminales en el ámbito americano. Y en el 2007 recibió otro reconocimiento muy importante que es el reconocimiento a su trayectoria eh, de la división crítica de la American Society of Criminology. Eh, es autor, editor de muchísimos libros, si quieren eh, mirar también acá hay dos de las obras de, eh, del profesor Barra. Del profesor Barra. Eh, y los temas que trabaja son temas de delito, policía, eh, medios de comunicación, violencia, sistema penal y un tema que a nosotros nos afecta muy particularmente que es muy interesante, de hecho escribió un libro sobre este tema y ganó premios por este tema eh, como lo es la situación de las personas que viven en la calle eh, y derechos humanos también está dentro de sus áreas de estudio eh, justamente uno de sus libros que se llama El robo de la nación el saqueo de Wall Street y la complicidad regulatoria federal eh, es uno de los libros que fue premiado eh, y tiene un libro en particular sobre Tim Shelter, la historia social de alguien que vive en la calle en la América contemporánea. ¿no? Es otro de los libros del profesor Barak que fue premiado. Eh, además es editor de una serie, y esto es muy interesante, porque se editó una serie que se está iniciando de, de la casa editora Rockledge, 
eh, que es justamente una edición sobre criminalidad de los poderosos, que es el tema del que nos va a estar hablando hoy. Eh, su libro más reciente, si lo traducimos es algo así como El poder corporativo desenfrenado, ¿Por qué los crímenes de las corporaciones multinacionales están altamente reutilizados y qué podemos hacer al respecto? Ese libro es base de lo que va a estar hablando hoy. Eh, bien, dicho todo esto, entonces lo dejo con el profesor para hablar de la invisibilidad y neutralización de los crímenes de los poderosos, el caso de la criminalidad de corporaciones multinacionales. Gracias. Mi nombre es María Laura Pong. Loud enough? Can you hear me back there? Okay. Good evening. The title of this presentation is The Invisibility and Neutralization of the Crimes of the Powerful. Subtitle The Case of Multinational Corporate Crime. Introduction. In a 1993 article in the American Scholar, The late sociologist and U.S. Democratic Senator Patrick, Daniel Patrick Morningham introduced the concept defining deviancy doubt. He was referring to the ways in which the United States frames particular legal violations out of existence. At the time, this concept along with the rising popularity of zero tolerance policies conjured up several earlier socio-political terms like permissive society, soft on crime, and moral decay. These mass mediated expressions spoke of threats of impending chaos and social disorder. This was also the time of so-called super predators, a connotation used to describe African American male youth who were allegedly associated with excessive violence and a lack of morality. This popular discourse addressed the political and economic desires to restore law and order vis-a-vis stepped-up forms of law enforcement and punishment. And the policies of crime control that shoots from such rhetoric both then and now have been primarily aimed at impoverished and marginalized communities of color. As used here, however, both the concept and the implementation implications of defining deviancy, and more specifically, crime down, have been reconstituted. For openers, the cultural application of defining most elite crimes, and in particular, multinational corporate crimes down, is augmented by the recognition that the vast majority of non-elite crimes are defined up. By examining or accounting for the full range of criminality, as well as for the cultural associations between defining some criminal behavior down and some criminal behavior up, the traditionally biased discourse of capitalist crime control is made explicitly clear. In other words, as the capitalist state has consistently responded differentially to crimes of multinationals as compared to virtually all other crimes, the contradictions of bourgeois legality are revealed. How does this political economy of crime control work? First, there are countless ways in which those crimes of multinational corporations are part and parcel of, and not at odds with, the law and order of a developing global political economy and capitalist state. 
in reoccurring instances of multinational corporate crime, the functionalities of accumulating and reproducing capital routinely outweigh any real concern with the criminality and victimization caused, or with the threats posed to the economy, the polity, the environment, and the ecosystem. These political-legal stances and the socially constructed attitudes toward multinational corporate crime sets these crimes apart from most other forms of corporate and almost all other forms of non-corporate crimes, resulting in the relative impunity of those multinational corporations involved in an array of criminal illegalities. In short, we have a state of affairs where bottom lines trump both the rule of law and the principles of equal protection under the law. Additionally, defining multinational corporate crime downward is reinforced by the problem of the invisibility and neutralization of the crimes of the powerful in general and of those multinational corporations in particular. The non out of these crimes and their relative absence from criminal punishment is further amplified by the bi-directional and reciprocal relationships established by defining some very select criminality downward and most criminality upward. For example, by defining down what Richard Quinney labeled almost 40 years ago as the quote-unquote crimes of domination and repression, on the one hand, committed by both the agents of multinational corporations and the capitalist state, and by defining upward what he labeled as quote-unquote the crimes of accommodation and resistance, on the other hand, committed by less powerful corporate entities and the vast majority of powerless offenders. We have a set of coexisting conditions in which the subjective and arbitrary, rather than the objective and neutral interpretations of the criminal law, prevail. Then, by way of cultural and legal feedback loops, we have the differential applications of the criminal law that dialectically favor the interests of the former offenders and disfavor the interests of the latter offenders. In the matters of everyday life, these reoccurring differential treatments or selective practices of penal enforcement ultimately define what are and are not considered to be crimes, regardless of what the law on the books may claim. Finally, because the pursuit of multinational offenders are the exceptions to the informal rules of non-criminal enforcement, and because their impunities from criminal sanctions are judiciously constant, I employ the idea of defining deviancy down in the case of multinational corporate crime as a conceptual device and not as a rationale, I repeat, not as a rationale for increasing their penalties. As I've argued elsewhere, and we'll talk about in more detail tomorrow night, there are plenty of alternative measures that could be more effectively used to curb multinational corporate crime and abuse. In the next part of this presentation, I will provide a synopsis 
of the comparative state of criminological research with respect to both street and sweet crime. Then I will transition into a brief discussion of the study of multinational corporate crime, where I suggest that it is more important to focus our attention on the law of inaction rather than on the law of action. After that, I will turn our attention to three kinds of multinational corporate crime that demonstrate the normality of impunity for the perpetrators of these offenses. These include, one, restructuring security trades and investments in order to escape some of the financial restrictions and or legal liabilities of the Dodd-Frank law. Two, insider trading and the worldwide rigging of interest rates. And three, international looting by means of tax evasion and labor exploitation. What each of these scenarios of crime and crime control exhibit are the tendencies of capitalist legal systems to routinize away the harms and injuries of multinational corporations. As Vincenzo Ruggiero refers to these financial transgressions in his book, Dirty Money, these are crimes without criminals. We've all heard of victimless crimes, but these are crimes without credit. Moreover, as I argue in my book, Unchecked Corporate Power, these crimes are tolerated without criminal sanctions because they are viewed as essential for the accumulation and the expansion of capital. Interestingly, the lack of criminalizing these crimes by the capitalist state also parallels the relative lack of interest in an investigation of these multinational criminals by the field of criminology. Second uh, section. Contextualizing the need and conceptualizing the lenses for investigating multinational corporate the needs and the lenses. With the one exception of the West Law Journal of White Collar Crime, which contains written analysis and commentary of the developments within relevant criminal and case law generally by members of the legal profession, there are no sociological or criminological journals devoted exclusively to the theory and practice of white collar, let alone corporate or multinational crime. Compared to the study of ordinary or indexed or street crimes, the study of white collar crime in general, as evidenced by published research, constitutes roughly 5% of the total output. Less than one half of that white collar crime research has been about corporate crime. And most of that investigation has not been about multinational corporate crime. In other words, probably less than 1% of all criminological inquiry, research, and scholarship have been devoted to multinational corporate crime. The dearth of criminological scholarship aimed at multinational corporate crime helps to keep these crimes of the powerful invisible and off the political and legal agendas. Even so, locally and globally, the devastating impact of these crimes threatens the well-being of all of us. For example, a December 6, 2016 cover story in the Sunday business section of the New York Times underscored 
how global bankers flouting their own policies and sustainable pledges to save the rainforest are financing projects to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars in multinational corporate loans. As a result of this kind of financialization, these projects are displacing indigenous communities, facilitating deforestation, destroying ecosystems, and contributing to climate change. Concurrently, an increasing body of empirical research demonstrates a growing anxiety among U.S. citizens concerning the dangers posed by these multinational offenders. Nonetheless, the first study designed to actually measure public knowledge about white-collar crime revealed that the participants were fairly ignorant about corporate crime, its harms, and victimization. Not surprisingly, more than two-thirds of the participants in this study thought that they were well informed on the subject. This study also disclosed that most people were influenced by popular myths about the crimes of the powerful which suggested more of an emotional or subjective rather than an informed or objective appreciation of the real cost in dollars lost and in lives harmed from these crimes of the powerful. Thus, at least one critical objective of the study of multinational corporate crimes must be to both demystify the existence and non-existence of these crimes, as well as to document just how out of control these crimes really are. As already indicated, part of the problem of conceptualizing multinational corporate crime stems from the fact that there have been a small number of high quality studies of corporate crime, and even fewer studies that have analyzed the crimes of multinational corporations. The limited evidence of multinational corporate crimes that does exist suggests that the criminal law and penal sanctions are of no deterrent value. On the other hand, regulatory laws and compliance policies have fared somewhat better. Either way, the perceived cost by those law-abiding individuals working on behalf of corporations, as well as the risk of penal sanctions for multinational corporate crime, in particular, are very small compared to the incentives or profitable rewards of non-compliance. A related conceptual problem stems from the lack of data and from the unimaginable and unknown dark figures of multinational corporate crime. As for the world of high-power multinational corporate crimes that we are aware of, their transgressions should be studied within the context of the prevailing legal trends worldwide. They should also be examined and framed with regard to the social parameters of capital accumulation and the geopolitics of globalization. More specifically, these investigations need to take into account both the current developments in the internationalization of criminal law and criminal justice, as well as in the application of international human rights law. Concerning the usual, excuse me, concerning the usage of international <coughs> criminal law, Slidrek maintains 
that there's been a general trend to normalize complicity inside of a multitude of liability models. These models of criminal wrongdoing include collective agency or co-perpetration. Unfortunately, these and other found formulations of collective guilt and criminal wrongdoing are not without their own problems and contradictions. Thus far, the applications of the relevant liability models of the law have been used narrowly and scarcely. For example, models of collective agency have been primarily, if not exclusively, applied to social groups like those involved in drug or human trafficking, rather than to social organizations like those involved in international securities frauds or other kinds of global financial harms and injuries. There are many types of international and banking crimes, such as money laundering, where they could be beneficial. As one of the world's leading regulatory investigators of financial institutions, Stephen Platt has demonstrated in his book, Criminal Capital, how the finance industry facilitates crime. The global practices of banking act as a circulation system for criminal money acquired through drug trafficking, terrorism, piracy, human trafficking, and tax evasion. In addition, these global financial institutions are routinely, also routinely participate in mis-selling, rate rigging, and sanctions evasion. Concerning globalization, the Commonweal, and international criminal justice, the editor of Globalization and its impact on the future of human rights and international law. M. Sharif Baziuni has written, quote, we are living through a period of decline in the observance of and respect for human rights as they have evolved since the end of World War II. And we may well be witnessing a setback in the evolution of international criminal justice. In a curious, not to say perverse way, our globalized world is becoming more interdependent and interconnected at the same time that it is becoming less committed to the identification and enforcement of the common good, end quote. Comparable conclusions have also been drawn from my edited volume the Rutledge International Handbook of the Crimes of the Powerful. Although Bosiuni's arguments and mine vary somewhat, we both agree that over the past couple of decades, quoting him again, globalization has not only enhanced the power and wealth of certain states, it has also given these states a claim of exceptionalism. That claim has also extended to certain multinational corporations and other non-state actors because of their wealth, worldwide activities, and their economic and political power and influence over national and international institutions. For all practical purposes, Many of these multinational entities have grown beyond the reach of the law, whether national or international." End quote. <clears throat> Probably nowhere is this statement truer than during the periods that led up to and followed the Wall Street implosion of 2008, wherein the identification and enforcement of the criminal laws, both domestic and international, were conspicuously absent from battling the epidemic 
of high stakes looting and high risk securities frauds that were operating throughout the financial services industry. Nine years later, not one of the top Wall Street bankers that were collectively responsible for the biggest financial crimes in the United States history has ever been charged, let alone prosecuted for or convicted of violating any criminal laws against securities fraud. One notable global exception was the country of Iceland where at least 26 bankers were sent to prison for the very same types of securities fraud. On the other side of the enforcement ledger, more than a few of those financial crimes of the past were essentially legalized through a combination of decriminalization and deregulation such as when the 1933 Glass-Steagall Act was repealed in 1999. Other forms of high-risk gambling, such as credit default swaps, have still not been outlawed as obvious conflicts of interest. These and other forms of financial gambling are also party to a derivative world of shadow banking subject to little in the way of state regulation. Analytically, these securities fraud enforcement dilemmas cannot be detached either from their codependency on capital accumulation or from the development of an evolving capitalist state. One fundamental difference between Basiuni and myself in our analyses of the role uh, played by bourgeois legality in, in the de implementation and, and development of the internationalization of criminal justice has to do with the ways in which we come to grips with the non-criminal intervention into human rights violations, high-risk financial frauds, and a host of other multinational economic and environmental crimes. When Bassiuni examines the present state of globalization and crime, he talks in terms of its positive and negative paradoxical effects on human rights violations and the lack of enforcement against such crimes. By contrast, when I examine the coexistence of the globalization of capital and the crimes of multinational uh, corporations and their non-criminal sanctions, I speak in terms of the historical contradictions between the enforcement of the criminal law on the one hand and the enforcement of capital accumulation coupled with the influential roles played by the World Bank, the IMF, and a number of international trade agreements, on the other hand. In other words, it is no coincidence that these international political and economic arrangements have consistently resulted in the favorable accommodations of the interests of multinational corporations often at the expense of the interests of consumers, workers, the environment, and so on. Okay, now turning to our three examples. The first, the case of restructuring securities investments and circumventing Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank was a 2010 mammoth piece of legislation that still has not been completed seven years later or implemented, but it was to rein in the behavior of, of Wall Street. And so this example is to, to demonstrate how the, the, the world of the powerful and wealthy are able to circumvent the, the law. What most people do not know about multinational corporate crime 
including the U.S. legislators on both sides of the political aisle who voted in favor of deregulation and for the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999, which, among other things, provided the final nail in the coffin separating the division between commercial and investment banks is that this law also permitted these merging banking institutions to virtually dwell into any and all economic activities. Banks can do anything at this point in time, whether it has anything to do with banking or not. As a consequence of one obscure and limitless legal clause, banks like Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Goldman Sachs now own oil tankers, run airports, and control huge quantities of coal, natural gas, heating oil, electric power, and precious metals. In other words, these banks are buying and trading in entire industries, no differently than the coal industries are doing. Meanwhile, oil industrialists are now engaging in financial transactions once confined to Wall Street bankers as they are trying to extricate themselves from the public hostility towards climate changing fossil fuels. Held by the passage of Dodd-Frank, there has also been a stepped up exchange taking place where bankers are becoming industrialists and industrialists are becoming security traders. In the case of the giant Wall Street financial firms, they have been buying oil that's still in the ground, the tankers that move it across the sea, the refineries that turn it into fuel, and the pipelines that bring it into your home. At the same time, these traders have been financially betting on the timing and efficiency of these industrial processes in various markets. For example, buying and selling oil stocks on the stock exchange, oil futures on the futures markets, and swaps on the swaps market, allowing a handful of banks to control the supply of crucial physical commodities and to trade in the financial products that might be related to those markets, such as aluminum in the case of Goldman Sachs. This represents not only an expansion of concentrated wealth, but it is also a furtherance of the financial secure services industry's dominance of the political economy. Of course, the combination of the two is an open invitation to permit mass manipulations and financial frauds when required by rising and falling prices. On the other hand, there are now those handful of industrialists and or technologists that are di diversifying their operations and moving aggressively into the financial markets like the brothers Charles and David Koch. Keep in mind that uh, all the students keep in mind that the Koch industries has profit revenues on the order of more than $100 billion annually. They're not a public organization, this is a private family business. Making it a non-public corporation that is larger than IBM, Honda, or Hewitt Packard. Second in size only to the largest private company in the United States, the agribusiness Colossus. Since the early 1990s, the Koch brothers, for example, have also been specializing in over-the-counter trades. 
These are trades that are not subject to regulation. They're private, they're unregulated contracts that are not disclosed on any kind of centralized exchange. Today, the Cokes are engaging in the full spectrum of trading activities once limited to the Wall Street financial giants, including such exotic securities as credit fault swaps and other derivative instruments. Coke Industries presently finds itself among the beneficiaries of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Financial Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. Case in point, one of those rules of the many rules of this piece of legislation, the Volcker Rule, bans investment banks from proprietary trading or investing their own money on their behalf in securities and derivatives. This, however, does not apply to the Koch brothers. It was only aimed at financial institutions. It's totally silent if somebody else is doing it, even though historically nobody else was allowed to do it. Uh, but today they are. Thus, as many Wall Street banks have had to unload their commodities trading units, non-bank traders like the Koch brothers, who are not prohibited from proprietary trading, are able to pick up clients who would have previously traded with J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, or Goldman Sachs. In other words, these new unregulated markets and securities have managed to circumvent the intention of the Dodd-Frank and its vulgar rule in particular. On the flip side, global bankers have been quietly assuming the formal roles of industrials who are once again getting out of the climate harming businesses. As a consequence of these operational exchanges, one could argue that after the Wall Street meltdown, the risk and harms to both the economic markets and the bioecosystems had been scarcely altered by such regulatory reforms because to a large extent, the perpetrators of both these environmental and financial assaults have simply traded places with licenses to do so. All right, so that's the first example. The second example, the rigging of interbank interest rates, an epidemic of global fraud exposed by the LIBOR scandal. I assume that most of you have heard of the LIBOR scandal. Okay, it's, it's more hidden than I thought. Okay, uh, then you'll enjoy that. The London interbank offer rate the London Interbank Offer Rate, or libel, LIBOR scandal that came to light in 2012 was a series of fraudulent rate submissions by those banks who submit interest rates for calculating an average interest rate used as a measure of the cost of borrowing between banks as well as setting a benchmark for interest rates worldwide. Um, it's not that complicated. Um, a bunch of banks get together, they tell you what it would cost to borrow money, they throw out the high ones and the low ones, and they sort of take an average, and that's the rate. The LIBOR calculating process and those of similar interbank rates measured elsewhere in the world, such as the Japanese Tokyo interbank offered rate, or the Tiber, or the Belgian-based Euro uh, interbank offered rate, or the Eurobor, work like this. A number of very large banks, typically not fewer than seven, why I have no idea, and not more than 18, 
are asked what interest rate they would have to pay to borrow money for a certain period of time and in a certain currency. Their responses are collected with a percentage of the lowest and highest cost out before the averages are calculated, creating the rate. Concerning the criminal and civil violations of the LIBOR that were committed before, during, and after the Wall Street implosion, these fraudulently submitted rates and the monies derived from these exceeded derived from these exceeded by orders of magnitude any financial scam in the history of markets anywhere. So this is the biggest financial crime of all time that we're that we're talking about. It dwarfs anything before, including Wall Street, which that's unthinkable to think about. Um, As one of the civil complaints read, uh, read, quote, by surreptitiously bilking investors of their rightful rates of return, defendants reaped hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars in ill-gotten gains. In the United States alone, early estimates, early estimated costs to the states, counties, and local governments came to at least $6 billion in fraudulent interest payments. Not counting $4 billion that the government spent to unwind their positions exposed to rate manipulations. In public responses, there were calls for resignations, criminal prosecutions, and stricter regulations of the financial sector. In addition, numerous civil lawsuits were filed by a diversity of plaintiffs, ranging from mutual funds to the city of Baltimore, that claimed they had lost profits on library-based securities due to banks' artificial suppression of the rate. Defendants in these cases included the Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Credit Suisse, HSBC, and Citigroup. Should be pointed out that before the short-lived outage developed, the LIBOR in the global world of finance was considered, quote unquote, the gold standard for benchmarking interest rates. That is to say, when the LIBOR, <coughs> excuse me, went up, uh, down, some borrowers enjoyed lowered interest rates. However, pensioners in general, as well as those who had invested in mutual funds, the poorer investors, would lose money by earning less in interest. Similar to insider trading in the stock market, having advanced knowledge of information or information of LIBOR rates <clears throat> can not only affect the value of a security or a commodity, but its manipulation can also be used to make lucrative profits off of trades. In terms of the routinization of these rigged rates, court documents have revealed that at the Royal Bank of Scotland, among senior traders, it was common practice to make requests to the bank's rate sellers, setters as to the appropriate LIBOR rate. Testimony from documents filed in Singapore by one RBS trader, Tan Shi Min, claimed that the LIBOR fixing process amounted to an interest rate cartel, where rates could be globally manipulated. In his court affidavit, Min maintained further that senior traders at RBS were not only aware of the rate manipulation, but th that they also supported such actions. Messages from one Barclays Capital BCS trader also revealed that for each basic, basis point, or 0.01% the library was moved, 
those involved could net a couple of millions of dollars. In 2012, there were roughly $10 trillion in loans, including credit cards, car loans, student loans, and adjustable rate mortgages, as well as some $350 trillion in derivatives that were all tied to the library. In July of that year, the United Kingdom based investment bank BCS paid $453 million in a settlement with the US and the UK uh, with regulators there, admitting that their traders had submitted fraudulent bank rates for the cost of borrowing between 2005 and 2008. These traders had repeatedly requested that their colleagues in charge of the LIBOR process tailor the bank's submissions to benefit the firm's trading positions. Barclays staffers also concluded with counterparts from other banks to manipulate rates. Additionally, during the height of the global financial crisis, between 2007 and early uh, 2009, BCS made artificially low LIBOR submissions because the bank was afraid that if its submissions were too high, then it would get punished in the markets as their investors would question the bank's health. As former U.S. Attorney General Lanny, Assistant Attorney General Lanny Brewer was quoted as saying regarding the settlement with UBS Financial Services, the real reason that Barclays had rigged the LIBOR rate was, quote, to maximize profits and to hide its weakness during the crisis. On December 11, 2012, the U.S. Department of Justice announced that HSBC Holdings, a British multinational banking and financial services company based in London and ranking as the fourth largest bank in the world with total assets of $2.67 trillion, had agreed to forfeit $1.25 billion and to pay $665 million in civil penalties for violating the Bank Secrecy Act, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, and the Trading with the Enemy Act. It also is worth noting that in the settlement, the Department of Justice had also agreed to not criminally prosecute HSBC for alleged terrorist Financing. One week later, UBS, Switzerland's biggest bank, settled with the US, the UK, and Swiss regulators for a sum of $1.5 billion for manipulating interest rates and for criminal charges against two former traders. The global investigation of these traders involved more than a dozen banks and brokers. In fact, regulators found that the Zurich-based bank made more than 2,000 requests to its own rate submitters, traders, and other banks and brokers to manipulate rate submissions through 2010. According to the Financial Services Authority, there were at least 45 bank employees including some managers who knew of the per pervasive practice and another 70 people who were included in open chats and messages where attempts to manipulate the LIBOR and Eurobor were discussed. In 2011, Japanese regulators had also temporarily suspended some of UBS and Citigroup's transactions after finding that both banks had attempted to influence LIBOR rates and related Tokyo interbank offer rate. Besides these multinational banks, 
There were other global banks involved in this kind of collusion and submission of fraudulent LIBOR rates. Back in March of 2011, the Wall Street Journal repeated that U.S. regulators were investigating Bank of America and Citigroup for manipulating the library. Even 11 months later, in February 2012, the U.S. Department of Justice announced that it was launching a criminal investigation into widespread library abuse. In July of 2012, the UK Serious Fraud Office announced that it too was opening a criminal investigation into the library. Not only was the UK looking into BCS's fraudulent submission rates, but also those of 20 other major banks. During the same month and year, the Canadian Competition Bureau, or the CCB, announced that it was carrying out an investigation into the Canadian branches of the RBS as well as the HSBC, Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan Bank, Citibank for price fixing around the yen dominated to dominated library rate. A federal prosecutor for the CCB stated that the interest rate derivative traders at the participant banks communicated with each other their desire to see a higher or lower yen LIBOR to aid their trading positions. By the end of 2015, more than a half dozen banks had paid out more than $10 billion to settle charges with regulators for fraudulent rate submissions. However, in the face of all the accusations against dozens of multinational or global banking giants, and in the midst of a worldwide rate rigging epidemic in the financial services industry, there were very few traders who were actually indicted and subsequently criminally prosecuted for securities fraud, less than a handful. There were no CEOs or chairman of the board or chairmen of the board who faced any type of criminal charges, although a number of them bowing to political pressure found it necessary to resign their leadership positions. Despite the lack of difficulty in convicting these multinational financial criminals for their habitual violations of the LIBOR, pretty much like the history of high finance crimes in general, these security fraudsters have, all, have, all, have for all intent and purposes been routinized away and decriminalized. Like the capitalist state's responses to the epidemic of security frauds in the financial services industry that led up to and caused the Wall Street meltdown, the social control of these criminals has primarily been subject to conciliatory settlements with the feds or to compensatory civil relief for select groups of investors. Rarely have the benefactors of these defrauding schemes been subject to any kind of penal sanction. In terms of compensation for the victims of life, plaintiff investors and municipalities initially filed a series of class actions in New York. Eventually, homeowners claiming that they too had been victimized by the library manipulations joined these lawsuits. They argued in effect that their mortgage repayments were, more, were made more expensive than they would have been. As a consequence, in many instances, homes were foreclosed and repossessed by lenders. In one class action suit filed in New York, Annie Bale Adams and her four co-led plaintiffs explained how their subprime mortgages were securitized in LIBOR-based collateralized 
debt obligations and sold by bankers to investors. Same thing that led up to the bubble of the housing crisis all around the world and sunk the banks. Uh, so nobody's learned any lessons, they're just doubling down and doing pretty much the same uh, as they were doing all along. The class action alleged that, that traders at 12 of the biggest banks in Europe and North America were incentivized to manipulate the London interbank offered rate to a higher rate on certain dates when adjustable mortgage interest rates were reset. According to the complaint, the result was that subprime homeowners between 2000 and 2009 ended up paying more. One Alabama-based attorney, John Sharborough, at the time of the filing stated that the number of plaintiffs could be as high as 100,000 and that each of them may have lost thousands of dollars. These plaintiffs held what had been called LIBOR plus adjustable rate mortgages. Moreover, according to the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, there were at least 900,000 outstanding U.S. home loans that originated between 2005 and 2009 with an unpaid principal balance of $275 billion that were all indexed to the library. Estimates of how much banks were going to end up paying in library lawsuits once ranged from a low of $7.8 billion to a high of $176 billion. However, in the spring of 2013, not surprisingly, a federal judge dismissed most, but not all of the libel lawsuits against 16 banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America, in part because the plaintiffs simply couldn't jump through all of the necessary hoops to show how they had been harmed by violations of U.S. antitrust laws. While the judge found that the plaintiffs had lacked standing to sue under relevant antitrust laws, as well as racketeer influence and corrupt organization statutes, he let some claims proceed under different laws. For example, he made it possible for big institutional <laughs> bond investors, including pension funds and money managers like Charles Schwab, to proceed. Similarly, lawsuits by derivative traders were allowed to go forward. In other words, all the big gamblers, the big players, they got to recoup their lost money. But the, but the average people, they didn't even get a dime, which is par for the course. Um, all right, so they resulted in many of the defendant banking institutions settling their cases financially for fractions of what they made from their ill-gotten good games. Okay, biggest crime in history financial crime in history. How invisible was it? Nobody knew what I was talking about. That's how invisible it is. And how, you know, it's just amazing. Uh, all right, the third example, the business model of tax avoidance. Uh, you know, the Panama Papers. And labor exploitation. The case of Apple and other multinational corporations. In 2015, Apple Inc. Report, reported a quarterly profit of $18 billion, the largest in history. During the same year, its market capital valuation of $765 billion reached the highest ever for any U.S. corporation. Based on total revenues of $233 billion 
for 2014-15 for a private, public, or state-owned company. <coughs> Next quarter. Apple ranked 12th in the world at the time. Uh, several factors have contributed to Apple's success over the years, including the vision of Steve Jobs, the execution of Apple engineers, the failure or refusal of Apple to pay a fraction of its fair share in taxes, and the super exploitation of the workers who manufacture Apple products. Of course, Apple has a lot of companies among other multinational corporations who also invest in the creation of shell companies and offshoring in order to evade their fair share of taxes. While their tax rates would be around 30% in the U.S. without the shell companies, with them, their tax rates drop to rates of around 2 to 5%. As the Panama Papers exposed to the whole world and the undercurrent and Australian comedy show explains in the seven plus minute video available on YouTube, companies like Apple, Google, and Facebook use offshore registration, transfer payments, debt loading, and tax havens to get lower tax rates than teachers and nurses. In the process, these multinational corporations starve, stay, starve their host countries, like Australia, of so much money that they find themselves engaged in austerity. Surprise, surprise. That's what you're doing, that's what the whole world is doing. Um, all right. Um, so, cutting back on expenditures for schools, Medicare, public broadcasting, climate change, indigenous services, and so on. In these cases of tax thieving or tax looting, a 2013 U.S. Senate investigation discovered that by creating male slot entities all over the world and attributing its profits to them, Apple had managed to pay just 2% in taxes on $74 billion of income overseas. Once again, Apple is in bad company when it comes to tax evasion. Offshore accounts and tax sheltering by multinational corporations and the very rich are estimated to constitute a hidden financial system valued at $21 trillion. This represents hundreds of billions of dollars annually in lost revenue or stolen money from the tax collector. According to Citizens for Tax Justice, 18 of the United States' largest corporations, led by Apple, deployed the same tactics to avoid paying the government $92 billion in 2014 alone. The same Senate report found that Apple, which has $181.1 billion socked away in offshore accounts, is among the group of multinational corporations lobbying Congress to grant them a second rep a repatriation tax holiday so that they can bring an estimated 1.7 trillion home at the significantly reduced rate of 6.5%, rather than what they're commonly getting at 2% and not at 30%, which is what they're told. Um, with President Trump now in office and Republican-controlled Congress, the likelihood of a second repatriation tax holiday 
for the super wealthy is just around the corner. In the case of worker exploitation, the state routinization of the inhumane conditions under which Apple's subcontracted employees work in China is well known, thanks to, in part to a BBC documentary, Panorama, that aired in December of 2014. The film reveals a series of broken promises made by Apple to various human rights and labor rights groups in 2012 to improve the working conditions inside of a number of Chinese facilities where employees of Pegatron and Foxconn busily assembled the newest iPhones. The filmmakers recorded the regular breaching of the standards established for workers' hours, ID cards, dormitories, work meetings, and juvenile employees. They also documented that in Indonesia, children were working in dangerous open cast mines and that the tin from these illegal dicks were also being used in iPhones. Apple's annual report for 2014 acknowledges that their compliance rate regarding their own standards was only 70%, down from 2013 when their compliance was 77%. The enforcement of worker hours was also down from the previous year. In a nutshell, these subcontracted workers are routinely exploited in various ways despite the reality that Apple's labor costs amount to a tiny fraction of its profits. And given the generous compensation packages enjoyed by their employers, for example, in 2011 and 12, the top nine members of Apple's executive team received compensation packages equal to that of fully 90,000 Chinese factory workers. So, you know, for every 10,000 workers, that's what they were. Subsequently, in 2015, the founder and the executive director of the workers' rights organization, China Labor Watch, reported that workers from Foxconn factories in cities of Chengdu and Shenzhen were being sent to Quanta Factory in, city of, in, in the city of Shenzhou to work 12-hour days making Apple watches in order to meet the company's April 24th release deadline. As there was a shortage of dormitory space for the workers at the factory, they found themselves forced to sleep in buses. These workers also found themselves producing watches in freezing temperatures while wearing thin work uniforms, and where close to 100 workers became ill and had to be hospitalized. Here again, when it comes to multinational corporate exploitation of laborers, it is not fair to single Apple out. After all, its record is far from the worst in the world of technology companies. All right, a very short conclusion, and then we'll open it up. Globally speaking, there is no compelling counter evidence to assume that other than the circumventing of Dodd-Frank or its equivalencies, the ridding of the interbank interest rates, the habitual tax avoidance, and the exploitation of labor by the most powerful multinationals, that these corporate practices are not part and parcel of their normal operating models of doing business. As these and other examples of multinational corporate crime, such as high stakes security frauds, against the environment or consumer abuse revealed.
the relevant criminal laws and the policing of these transgressions, both nationally and internationally, have been conspicuously absent from the capitalist state's well-armed arsenal of legal weaponry that allegedly fights against all forms of criminality. In sum, the prevailing state of criminal impunity and the normalization or routinization of these and other multinational corporate crimes can be explained in terms of the historical contradictions between, once again, the enforcement of the criminal law on the one hand and the enforcement of capital accumulation and reproduction on the other hand. These contradictions result in the latter overcoming and defeating the former, while the vast majority of this decriminalization is actually indifferent to the existing criminal sanctions and to all the victimization caused by the crimes of multinational to fraud or to 
uh, commit the fraud and so on, and that's why they win money and they get agreements instead of getting criminal laws. But uh, you mentioned one case in particular, that is the ICANN case. I, I remember that before that they changed the constitution, they applied some direct democracy to change it, and basically I think this is the key because they changed the scenario. They go through sanction the big bankers and so on, and they change the, the global scenario, the context, they, they don't get a reward, they are punished against the, the US case that basically says and reward uh, the people uh, saving these too big to fail companies. Um, so I think that uh, is the, the epidemic problem, but not as, as economic problem, but simply as a, as a game theory or as a rational economy uh, act that we must expect, as you say, it's normal from this act. What do you think? Um, I only think that it's normal. In the, in the context of exponential capital accumulation, that's what's that's what's driving the, this behavior. The fact that they're violating the laws, it's in combination with things they're doing that conform with the law. At the end of the day, making profit, accumulating money, gets gets a pass. It's not it's not threat. But let, let me go back to another point you made that I think is helpful. The notion that we did not that we bailed out the banks because they were too big to fail or jail is a myth. It's a lie. You could have broken them up. You could have applied the corporate death penalty to these entities, the corporate death penalty to career CEOs without damaging or harming the investors or the employees of those institutions. So it's simply not true that they that we would have all gone down had they not done us. I agree with you that uh, the problem of major banks uh, to be fair is me, but uh, I think the, the key or the major problem is in the context. We live in the context, you mentioned only one case, that is Island State, uh, which uh, eventually we believe in, most people believe in national economics and we tend to say that, but the problem is the, the context, the result. When you examine the, all the results from historical point of view, all those points. All these examples, uh, they don't get, they get rewarded in the final. So I think we should move to, to another context, and Iceland is yeah, the perfect example, and Sandy is the, the only example, I think. Right, well, you know, it was, it was small. Iceland was small potatoes, really. I mean, you know, if you, you, know, you don't have that much money at, at stake. Um, I just use it as an example to say they were doing the same thing. The other question becomes, um, you know, why do we rationalize or you know, why does anyone pay billions and billions of dollars in fines if they haven't done anything? And yet they don't have to admit that they did it. To me, no amount of criminal law will ever be applied to, to these crimes. 
Okay, they will get a free pass. So the question becomes, what can you do to, to check it? Um, to me, the super multinational corporations should either be nationalized or they should become public utilities and they should be sort of collectively owned and then they would be a little bit more responsible if that were the case. There are other things that are going on, but that's one of them. I used to think you needed to break up the banks, but I don't really think that any longer. Um, because I would like to disadvantage relative to other banks in the world. I mean, ultimately, um, we have to really move in the direction of sustainable growth. And we're not in that mindset. We're still playing as though we can expand the bottom line and continue to grow. And we're no longer a growth economy, we're really a debtor economy at this point in time. Money is really being made off of debt, not off of producing anything. And, you know, when's there going to be a jubilee becomes a question because you know, states can't pay their bills, individuals can't pay their bills, nations can't pay their bills. Um, clearly not working. Quería consultarles respecto a el último punto cuando habló de Apple, porque en toda su presentación hizo mención a distintos casos judiciales que había respecto a, la, a los crímenes financieros e inversiones efectuados por los bancos. Ahora, cuando habló de Apple y puntualmente lo que ocurrió con casi se podría decir esclavitud respecto a, creo que era China si no me equivoco, eh, nunca habló de cuáles eran las respuestas judiciales sobre, esa, sobre responsabilidad puntualmente de la empresa. ¿Qué ocurre en este caso en Estados Unidos, que sé que tienen la Alien Startup, respecto a actos que ocurren fuera del de, eh, espacio territorial de Estados Unidos, pero que tienen una relación con empresas, en este caso eh, de Norteamérica? ¿Cómo, cómo, se, ¿Cómo responde, cómo debería responder la empresa? ¿Es una responsabilidad? empresarial, una responsabilidad de los directores, hay responsabilidad penal, ¿qué es lo que usted cree?
from engaging in. So if those were public utilities, if they were on the collective rate, the, the money, the gross money that those executives were making would find its way to the, the worker who is enslaved. That is sort of my answer. I, mean, I don't have much faith in, in, in the law rescuing this, because to me these are structural problems and it's good for business. I mean, this is too bad. Um, Muchas gracias, Horacio Vicente, su exposición por las inquietudes que nos deja. Es como una película sin final, pero al final no vamos a tener que estar nosotros. Eh, nosotros nos refiero al mundo globalizado. ¿no? Y siguiendo a la pregunta de la colega anterior, hay, hay un tema que usted tocó que es el tema justicia. Eh, pareciera que no hay justicia, por lo menos los modelos que hay eh, no son los convincentes para obtener por lo menos una resolución favorable al mundo. Para que esto se pare de alguna manera. Y mi pregunta es si usted tiene en mente esa dio una, una parte de su definición sobre los tribunales internacionales, eh, un poco su descreimiento. Y si en función de eso, si usted tiene en mente, en, en ¿cuál sería el modelo de justicia para poder perseguir con resultados favorables este tipo de delitos? ¿Y cómo investigar este tipo de delitos? Porque nosotros sabemos que, que desde los, los modelos tradicionales de justicia domésticos, o nacionales, eh, y cómo investigar no está estructurado todavía.
when they were debating to break up the banks or to bail them out. There was literally a debate in President Obama's office in his first month between the former uh, Treasury Secretary and his first appointed Treasury Secretary arguing the merits for six hours to break up or not to break up. At the same time that that's going on, the Department of Justice disappears 3,000 investigations dating back from 1993 up until 2009. They, they made all of those pending cases disappear. No records. You know, this was testimony from the person in the office who came to the Congress. So, I mean, there's no desire to prosecute them. So it's really a structural change. It's not that there isn't a variety of forms of justice. In fact, I mean, there's so much irony here. When they bailed out uh, the banks for you know what appeared to be, these banks are subsidized anyway. If they didn't get special loans, they don't even really make any money. That's the, the craziness about it. If you look at them without their subsidies year in and year out, they basically break even. But they manage to put billions into their own pockets, you know, at, at whose expense. But there was $40 billion set aside to help out all of the people whose houses were worth one third less than what they were before the implosion. You had people who lost homes, millions of people. They had the money put aside to bail out the victims of, of these crimes and chose to only spend four million of that money and not to spend the rest of it to bail out the people. Why? The argument was that they, they being the administrators, thought that these people were reckless and that they took out loans for houses that they couldn't afford. And why should we reward them? Of course, all of this was created by the incentives to collect these, you know, once upon a time, sorry, once upon a time, when you took a loan from a bank, it was in your neighborhood. And they had to hold that loan, and they knew who you were, and they wouldn't give you a loan if they didn't think you could pay for it. Um, now these loans were put together in packages, sold to other people, Nobody knew who opened the law. I mean, the whole thing is just a scam. So it's not that the legal system could not perform. I believe it could perform. I just don't believe that whatever crimes are dominant, whatever part of the economy, whether it's investment, financialization, today it's all about banks not producing anything, but just making money on money. If that's where the money is right now, they're going to get a pass. And so unless you challenge that form of banking or that form of multinational uh, exploration, I don't think the law is going to do much. I mean, these um, international trade agreements, the one that sort of dead in the water, the triple TPP, the new one. They're creating international corporate courts that are not beholden to any law, which allows corporations to sue governments for protecting the consumer or the environment if their protections impede on uh, their bottom line. Well, if, if you have that kind of system, there'll be justice according to 
those laws, it, it's insane. I mean, it's insane. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> <laughs>
just a lot of BS. I mean, he's not going to protect anything. He won't <laughs> deliver on a single promise that he's made. He's about as laissez-faire and free market as anyone could possibly be. What he does around the world is built upon that. He's not going to build a wall. He's not going to not participate in these treaties. You know, he won't deli deliver on those kinds of promises. <laughs> What he will deliver on is the same neoliberal privatization austerity mantra that's been going on for 35, 40 years. Uh, he'll double down, triple down, just like this country's doing, just like Brazil's doing, just like every country around the world is doing because they're marching to the tune of the IMF and the World Bank and they don't have an out. They don't have an alternative view. I often quote um, uh, Greenspan, the longest uh, sitting uh, uh, Fed director for 18 years. And he goes, gee, I used to believe in free markets. Now, now I don't. <laughs> OK, and what do you have for you know, some alternative? He used to be a Canadian. He, you know, once upon a time, he 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 bought into that in his early life, uh, and then he made his way moving away from that. He should return to that, but he's not willing to return to that. He throws his hands up right now, and he says, "I really believe now that the bank should be broken up." That's what he says in his last book. Um, especially if they, uh, you know, are a little smaller than they were. He's saying that at a time where everybody knows they're much bigger already than they were. They consumed some 1,500 banks went under in 2000.